my brother uh, Mark Harbour and I um, share a, a very close and, and special bond. Um, he was he was diagnosed with, with cancer, uh, leukaemia, uh, when he was 16 years old. Um, he come home one day uh, from school, um, sort of telling mum that she, he had a high temperature, um, and he just gradually started um, getting a high fever, high temperature, um, and then so before you know it, he had to be rushed to the cancer based hospital. Um, and and within a couple of hours, he was he was in, in intensive care. Um, and no one really knew what was going on, so we knew the the next next best thing um, for him to get to get him um, to get him better um, to get checked up was to, was to fly to Townsville, um, where they where they knew that they could diagnose him properly and start the specialist treatment that he needed. So it wasn't until we, we got to got to Townsville. Um, I was 13 years old at the time in grade eight. Uh, it wasn't until then that um, they found out that he, he was diagnosed with with leukaemia. Um, and, he, and his health was, was just declining from there. So uh, we got the there yeah, we got the the bad news. Um, all the family had to pack up cans, head down head down to Townsville. Um, it was a four hour drive um, at the time. Uh, he couldn't he couldn't go in a car or an ambulance. Um, so it was it was a massive massive effort from the Royal uh, Flying Doctors at the time to fly him down to, to Townsville to, to begin his treatment. So. Um, yeah, so he started chemotherapy. Um, I started a new school, um, started a new footy club, and uh, the family packed up and moved to moved to Townsville. It was uh, the Leukemia Foundation who put us up in, uh, in, a, in a little apartment um, that was close to the hospital, close to the school um, at the time. And um, yeah, a couple of months into it, um, his chemotherapy uh, started working. However, um, he started hemorrhaging um, in the brain, um, and then was told that he only had a 40% chance of, of, of living. Um, so then immediate action was needed at the time and um, we needed to find a donor. He needed a bone marrow transplant um, to, to try and get in there um, and fix him up pretty much. So I was, I was the first cab off the rank. Um, I was his, his, his closest brother. Um, and so I got a blood test to try and see if, if our, blood, our bloods matched. Um, if, if, if my blood didn't match, then I had to find, go look around the state look in the country, if not then look internationally to try and find the right um, blood type to be his donor. Um, luckily uh, our bloods matched, um, I, 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 then, um, I then began to, to, to get treatment uh, myself to try and um, boost my stem cell counts um, in, my, um, in, in the body. Um, so that, re that was a pretty, pretty tough um, process for the two weeks leading up to, 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 the, to the, uh, the treatment. Um, and the transplant, I had to get injections in my stomach twice a day um, for, up for up to two weeks to try and boost my stem cell counts. Um, so then, they, then hopefully they would, they would recheck if I had enough uh, stem cells in the body to be able to uh, begin the transplant. Um, two weeks after, um, yeah, that I had another blood test, found out that there was enough um, stem cells uh, to be able to start the transplant. Uh, the process was, was quite long. I had to sit in a, on a dialysis machine for four hours, um, attached, to, attached to cords coming out both of my arms. Um, blood was coming out one, one arm um, and then it had to be separated into, into a small bag where the stem cells would be separated from the blood and the rest of the blood would just come back into the other arm. Four hours later, um, they found out I didn't have enough stem cells in that one sitting, um, so then the only process after that was to was to come back the next day and repeat it again for another four hours. Um, I was I was 13 in grade eight at the time. Um, I didn't know any different. Um, all I wanted to do was just save my brother's life, and and that's pretty much all I did. So um, yeah, we, we got stuck into the to the, the second day of treatment. Uh, it was yeah, it was quite painful the second day. Obviously, bruises all in my arm um, from where the drips were coming out. Uh, we got it done, um, uh, and, and immediately uh, my brother was sent into emergency room to, to, to start his transplant and get the stem cells, um, and hopefully that would do the job. Luckily enough, um, it worked. Uh, he got the transplant, um, the stem cell transplant that I gave him uh, worked, and um, he started rapidly improving in his health and, and, and got a lot better um, after that, which was a massive relief. Uh, and yeah, our bond grew from there. We obviously that brought a lot of testing times, not just for my brother who was going through the to the 
through the toughest of it all, but for the family, um, my mum and dad, and, and we've got another older brother, Leon, as well, um, who was all a part of it. So, yeah, t t challenging times, but I suppose um, we learnt a lot of lessons off of that. Um, me and my brother obviously grew a lot more closer. We all shared a little joke where, because we had the stem cell transplant, his blood would then turn into mine. So any time he bleeds now, he's bleeding my blood. And um, I think after that, we, we share a little joke where you bleed like that's my blood you're losing there, mate. So don't try and lose any, um, lose any more. So yeah, it's it's just something that yeah we, we always can relate back to. Um, that's probably the most challenging time that he's been through, that the family's been through. So we found that any challenges now, um, we think back to that back to that point where he's hemorrhaging in the brain where it was close to, I suppose it was close to death and um, yeah, if we can get through um, a, a challenging period like that then I'm sure we could real, we can get through anything. Um, so that's sort of been a mantra um, growing up. We learned at a young age to, to just, if there's something that needs to be done, um, you just do it. You, you kind of, you don't really ask questions. Um, you just go ahead and do it and um, you're doing it for the right reasons as well. I had to show um, a lot of strength at the time um, and show that uh, I wasn't scared. Um, I wasn't in the position Mark was in. I'm sure he was. He was. He was really scared about what was going on. He didn't know about it. We didn't really have. Um, we didn't. Cancer wasn't an issue in our family. Passed down um, through generations. It wasn't really an issue. Uh, it wasn't a problem. So um, it sort of come out of nowhere and. Um, I always kept thinking that he's the one doing it tough here. Um, I can't feel sorry for myself. I can't, um, yeah, I left school, um, moved to town, so I had to start a new school, a new footy club, meet new mates. But um, that's just a small part of, of, of doing what you need to do to, I suppose, save someone's life. And um, Mark was the one doing it tough. Um, so I wasn't in the hospital bed, I wasn't sick. Um, so then I felt like I had, I had a really, um, a big role to play in all of this um, because uh, he was the one that was going through the tough times and it was challenging so I had to put on a brave face and, and, be, and be selfless not only for Mark but also for my family as well um, they needed strength and, um, and, and they needed someone positive uh, to be able to get them through it as well before Mark got, before Mark got sick he, he was um, an aspiring footballer he was certainly up and coming, making all the rep teams um, throughout Cairns and, and around Queensland. Uh, and his his dream was to was to try and make as far as he can to be able to hopefully play AFL at the highest level. He was certainly on his way, but then um, he got struck down, which which yeah put a stop to all of that. Uh, he was told after the treatment, um, and once he got better and everything, that he wasn't allowed to play contact footy uh, for another two years um, after that. So then he thought. Um, yeah, once once that two years was up, he's gonna get he's gonna give it a crack and head straight back into footy and, and, and play. Um, and I suppose I was I was really keen to, to play in his first game back as well. Uh, and I still remember that day. Um, he was just three years older, so it might have been under would have been uh, under 18s, um, and I was just under 16s at the time. And um, he played his first game back and. Uh, we were playing up in Cairns at the time, and um, yeah, it was pretty awesome. It was pretty, it was a special moment. We all grew up playing footy with our cousins and, and close friends, and by that stage, a lot of cousins had drifted off, and, and our friends were all over the place, working and, and just finishing off school. So everyone came back for that game. All the same crew, all the same cousins came back for that one game. So we can all share that in that in that one moment with Mark when his first game back um, after after his cancer. So uh, we got the win. Um, I won't brag, but I got best on that game. But he had a good game, and it was just a massive relief for him to get back on the footy field um, and and continue doing something that he loved. He obviously knew that his dream of playing football um, was probably over. So then he thought, what's um, the next best for him was to okay, if I can't play in the AFL, how can I work for the AFL? How can I use my experience, uh, my knowledge, and everything that I went through? How can I try and help someone, other people, to be able to um, try and try and um, create a pathway for them to be able to reach their dreams? So uh, he, he then started working for AFL Cairns, um, AFL Cape York, and um, and a bit in a stint with AFL Queensland. Um, and I suppose during that time, he thought um, he had a bit of time in the school holidays, so he done a lot of work up throughout Cape York. 
um, and the Torres Strait. So he, during the school holidays, um, he would go up to the different communities throughout the Cape and, and run a few um, sporting programs, um, a few hip hop classes. He's, he's a bit of, a, well, he thinks he's a bit of a dancer um, back in the day. So he, he wanted to do a bit of um, hip hop classes, a bit of dancing, um, a bit of football, a bit of fun for the for the youth. Um, for the young kids in the, in the school holiday times, pretty much just to occupy their time and give them some, some fun stuff to sort of look forward, um, look forward to um, in their school holidays, give them a bit of structure, because they get that structure from school in the school holidays. Um, he thought, yeah, he wouldn't mind helping out and traveling, traveling to different communities throughout the, throughout the school holidays and, and give them a bit of fun stuff to look forward to. So I suppose that's where he came up with the concept um, in 2010 of, of Harbour and Mentoring. Um, it was his own brand. It was, it was everything that sort of he was very passionate about. He was, he was passionate about assisting and, and helping youth, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, um, to give them an opportunity to, to feel motivated, confident, um, and, and give them the opportunity to, to, to live a, a, an active and a healthy lifestyle. So that just grew from there. Um, he, he, he started uh, in coming up with, with a few different programs throughout the Cape um, and then in and around Cairns um, and it was growing and it was something that he was very passionate about um, and then he started, he was working with, with AFL um, at the time um, and he'd done a bit of work with, with PCYC and stuff like that and Harbour Mentor was just a bit of a part-time casual stuff that it was his passion on the side that, that he thought that he really wanted to invest in so yeah it just grew from there and I suppose uh, that's where I, I came into it. I was, I'm just as passionate about the, the same sort of stuff that um, that he. The reason why he started Harbour Mentoring was to give youth uh, a platform and opportunity to be able to um, live a healthy and, and active lifestyle. So um, that's where I came into Harbour Mentoring and um, joined my brother in a partnership. And and yeah, we we started um, yeah developing programs um, uh, in Cairns, and I've just recently started to. Um, uh, start programs down here on the Gold Coast. At a Harbour Mentor and our, our three key pillars that, that we focus on um, is, is leadership, mentoring and sports and I think they all sort of connect in with each other um, and all the messages are, are all fairly simple so uh, there's not a one size uh, fit all approach. Um, you're dealing with uh, youth who who sometimes need a lot more structure and, and motivation than others. Um, you might come across a young, young indigenous kid from a, from a, a really remote community where la English is his third, fourth language, um, and it's being able to give someone like that boy or girl the opportunity to express themselves in in any type of environment. So they they have the right to be able to feel supported in in, in a culturally supported environment, no matter sort of where they where they go, um, because it's. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the opportunities that you want to be able to give um, youth um, that I suppose that we sort of really want to be able to instill um, in, in the youth and um, our main focus is, is to try and motivate and inspire um, these boys and girls as best as we can and um, I suppose the, the big picture in, in the future for all of this is that um, there's really no end goal, um, there's no um, there's there's nothing that sort of we feel that we can't be able to do. I suppose our, our experiences, our life experiences that we've been through, our knowledge that we've gained over the years, and um, the experience that we've seen in, in dealing with youth um, from all walks of life, um, really gives us um, the chance to to implement programs and development program develop programs where we're able to not only be the leaders, but a real something that's really important to us is to create more leaders um, for them to go on and then um, inspire the next generation of young leaders so if we're able to help out in that way inspire um, young young leaders to, to then go on um, to, to be, be leaders themselves and I think we're doing a pretty good job in a culturally supportive environment giving them the tools um, to be able to deal with all, all types of different um, scenarios in life and no matter what life throws at you um, there's going to be challenges um, it, it's how you respond and how you bounce back up um, and yeah it's, a, it's about having that that um, outlook on life where you're going to be hit with challenges but it's how you respond and, and bounce back up and um, you can all there's always someone out there doing it worse and 
yeah, how do you get out of your comfort zone to be able to um, give someone else a better opportunity?